Those predictable patterns that we can classify as linking or liaison involve the smooth connections of sounds so that the speech flows smoothly with the last sound of one syllable being connected to or becoming the initial sound of the next syllable, even if that next syllable is part of a different word. And this doesn't only happen between vowel sounds as with glides like the w sound between bow out or the y sound between cry on. When one word ending with a consonant comes before another word or syllable beginning with a vowel, the consonant may be pronounced like it belongs to both words. This is called intervocalic consonant sharing. I once had a student ask me what a tupwith was, and I had no idea. He told me he'd heard the word on the radio, and he couldn't find it in his dictionary. I, I honestly didn't know the word, so I asked him for the sentence. He'd written the whole sentence down, he was a very good student, and he pulled it out of his baggy jeans. And when he showed me what he thought he had heard, I understood. The sentence was, I couldn't put up with my sister's behavior. Put up with. Put up with becomes put up with. The intervocalic consonant sharing had for him uh, caused him to have trouble discerning the word boundaries. Now, when a word ending with two consonants, that is, a consonant cluster, appears before a vowel, the second consonant may be heard as part of the word that follows. This is called resyllabification. Take the words lived up. Now lived may look like it ends with a vowel e followed by a consonant d, but that's only in the writing. We're talking about how the word is pronounced, and it's pronounced lived. Lived is pronounced with two consonants at the end, a v followed by a d. Lived. Vd. Vd. Now, when the next word begins with a vowel, the consonant decides to live it up by parting over with the other word, as in the pronunciation lived up. Listen to what happens when we add another word, lived, making lived it up. The resyllabification happens when the D sound jumps to the beginning of the word it, lived it, and the intervocalic consonant sharing happens when the T sound on it moonlights as the in initial sound of up. Lived it up. Lived it up. The next type of linking is a little more subtle. But if you listen for it, you'll hear it a lot. When a word ending with one consonant is followed by a word beginning with an identical consonant, you'll hear the two consonants pronounced as one longer consonant. This is the case when a word like eat is followed by a word like tomatoes. Eat tomatoes, eat tomatoes. Or lived, followed by down, live down, live down. You don't hear two separate consonants there. You don't hear eat tomatoes, and you don't hear lived down. You hear live down, or eat tomatoes. Finally, we also have the linking that happens when a word ending with a stop is followed by another word beginning with a stop, as in the words, keep tomatoes. Or, when a word beginning with an affricate, when a word, sorry, when a word ending with a stop is followed by a word beginning with an affricate, as in the words, bad cellist. In these positions, the stop is unreleased. This means uh, it isn't, we don't let go of the stop, we uh, hold that little puff of air and keep it in. So we don't say keep tomatoes. We say keep tomatoes. The p stop is unreleased. And we don't say bad cellist. We say bad cellist. Bad cellist. The d sound is unreleased. So, now that we've talked about 
several different kinds of linking, here's an exercise for you. Give your own example of each of the types of linking below. You can work with the book Teaching Pronunciation, but the example should be your own and not one from the book or from this presentation. Another exercise for you, more of a riddle. Why did the word naprin become apron? You know what an apron is, but originally the word was pronounced naprin. What happened to the N? The answer involves linking.